What would happen if 6,000 U.S. citizens were taken captive and imprisoned every year? What would we do as a society to save them? I am a 47-year-old man married to my best friend and soulmate, Kathy, with three incredible teenage boys, Scott, Jake, and Joe. I have, beyond all measures, been extremely blessed in life. I've spent over 30 years starting, designing, and building small businesses. I have always had the ability to bring out the best in people, see problems, and find effective solutions for those problems. I have always been a student of self-development and leadership. I have read over 1,000 books, attended numerous seminars, and had countless coaches and mentors to help me hone those skills. Many would say that my best assets are my ability to observe, listen, learn, build a plan, and create a cohesive team to get that plan done. I have always been somebody that truly has appreciated and admired and respected time. I often would say, we all have 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 24 hours in a day. It is what we do with that time that separates us and actually decides the quality of our life. Imagine if Bill Gates and Warren Buffett combined all of their money, they could not buy back that last second, minute, or hour. So if time cannot be manufactured, bought, or sold, it is the most precious commodity in the world. I often say that time should never, ever be taken for granted or wasted. God only knows how much time we truly have, and I was about to find out that I did not have the time that I thought I did. About a year ago on Columbus Day weekend, I was up in New Hampshire with my boys hiking. The next day, I woke up with a pain in my calf. By Thanksgiving, that pain had come into my hamstring. The week before Christmas, we went away on a family vacation, and as I was coming out of the ocean, I stepped onto the soft sand, and I felt weakness in my right leg. Later on that week, I had twitching in my left arm and twitching throughout my body. After the holidays, I went to see a doctor, and after many, many tests and continual weakness in my right leg, I got the news, no 47-year-old man on top of the world in the prime of his life ever wanted to hear. You have ALS, a death sentence. At that moment, time stops and stood still. All of my goals and dreams stopped. All I could think about was all the work I had done to coach and build and develop and grow my great kids that I would not be there to see all those great milestones in life. At that moment, I knew why. I had always appreciated time and always respected it so much because I just was not going to have the time that I thought I would. ALS is a motor neuron disease where you lose the ability to use your voluntary muscles. Eventually, I will lose the ability to use my arms and my legs. Right now, I cannot walk. My right leg, I barely use it. My right arm and shoulder is just about gone. Eventually, I will, use, I will lose my ability to brush my teeth, clothe myself, bathe myself, or even feed myself, or even itch. Eventually, I will lose the ability to swallow, causing me to have to get a feeding tube just to get some nutrition into my body as I begin to waste away. Soon, I will lose the ability to speak, causing me to be trapped in my own body. Imagine this for one second. You're lying there in bed and a mosquito comes into the room. You can see the mosquito. You can hear it as it buzz, buzzes right near your ear and it nestles just behind your ear and begins to bite you. You can't swat it away. You can't motion to anybody to help you. You can't even say anything. You just have to internalize it and begin to, to try to deal with it internally only. Eventually, you lose your ability to breathe and you suffocate and you die. With a diagnosis like that, you have two options. One option is to go home, curl up in a ball, cry, be depressed, cry. One I blame nobody for doing for this horrific news. And the other option is, how do I take my skill set? How do I take my assets 
and do something with them? How do I move the needle forward ever so slightly to maybe make a change and maybe make a difference? And that's the option that I chose. So I began to study and research night and day. And I found problems in three basic areas, the research doctors, fundraising, and care. We're in Boston. We're in the medical capital of the world. This is the medical Silicon Valley. And as I began to research and talk to the doctors, I was amazed at what I found. The ALS doctors spend 50% of their time trying to raise funds on their own. I was dumbfounded. I said to myself, this has to be the biggest waste of time and underutilization of skills I had seen in all my 30 years of business. I just couldn't believe it. The next thing I found out is that they didn't quite share all their information. But more importantly, they did not share their failures. And I know from all, all the things I have done in life, I learned more from my failures than I did my successes. So if the failures weren't shared, there was duplication of a lot of effort and research in the labs because other doctors didn't know it didn't work. That all resulted in a complete waste of, of, of money and more importantly, the most precious commodity in the world, time. So in essence, I saw inefficient use of time, lack of capital, individual silos, and no real teamwork. When I got into the fundraising community, I found the exact same thing. Things weren't much different. We had all these little fundraising groups all around the area. And I realized and found out that ALS is the most fractured fundraising group in the entire country. And I saw a lot of the same things. So if they worked, if they worked individually, they weren't leveraging the power of a team. They weren't utilizing their assets. And we had a lot of duplication in marketing, in administration, in management cost. All of this led to an inefficient use of capital and a waste of the most precious commodity in the world, time. When it came to cure, uh, ALS looks like this. Uh, when you get this disease, you end up losing your job, you have to quit. Uh, your family goes into financial crisis. Uh, the, typical family, the typical person is, you know, typical family has, an, has enormous uh, emotional challenges. And everything that you need to buy in your house, insurance doesn't pay for. It might be just a seat to get, you, to get you up off the chair. It might be a toilet seat that's mechanical to help lift you up. It might be a lift to get you up the stairs or a lift to get you in a house or ramps to get you around or a scooter like this, as, as, as like mechanical legs. All of this costing tens of thousands of dollars while your family is watching you decay and you're in an emotional, an, an emotional crisis. So there's nonprofit groups out there that come in and kind of help, try to help with these situations. But they don't work in unison with the clinics in the hospitals. So you have the, this complete disconnect. And more people would give to research than they would cure, so there's a real lack of funding there. I soon realized that there was no ALS team in the greatest medical community in the world. Yet, yet, the greatest ALS doctors in the country, if not the world, were right here in Boston. And I said to myself, how can I use my skills and talents to try to bring this together and make a difference? So I said, maybe I can get them together and become a team. So I started to call. I started to meet with them. I got a, a conference room in Mass General Hospital, and I invited them all to come. The, gr the greatest doctors in the ALS world to come in, to, to come in, in this conference room, and they were Dr. Bob Brown, who uh, works at UMass Medical Center, is considered the godfather of ALS. Dr. Merit Sokovich, who is the chief of neurology of Mass General Hospital and considered the godmother of ALS. Dr. Steve Perrin, who runs the only biomedical company in the United States that's exclusively for ALS and a nonprofit. Dr. Nazim Atassi, who's an upcoming bright star in the world of ALS who is working on the first biomarker for ALS and teaches at Harvard, and, and uh, Ron Hoffman, Compassionate Care ALS, who, uh, who basically is taking 1,000 families from death to diagnosis over the last 20 years. The first meeting was interesting. None of them thought each other were going to show up, but they all did. And we got into the room, 
And the one hour meeting turned into three hours. And you could see, you could see these bright minds start to open up. At the end of the first meeting, Dr. Brown said, I'm willing to clear my calendar on Monday if you guys can come back. Well, nobody says no to the godfather of ALS. <laughs> and they all said, okay, if you're clearing your calendar, we'll be back. And they all came back on Monday, and another few hours later, and another meeting later, and I began to see some amazing things happen. I began to see kind, caring, dedicated people that are passionate about the, what they do start to get passionate about helping each other. We decided to break things up into, into committees. We made a marketing committee. We got a, the, the development committee of all the institutions, and they all came together and we said, okay, if these guys got together as a team, how could we support them? How could we help them? What could we do to make a difference? As, as time continued to go on, we, we, we also created a care team where Ron Hoffman worked with some of the care people to decide, how could we build this care plan that could be the model for the United States? Most importantly, the science, scientists started to get together and create a science plan with the premise that if we had to create a treatment in four years or less, how could we do it as a team? How could we do it as a partnership? And I am proud to say that we are now launching ALS-1. It is unprecedented. The greatest institutions in the United States in medical and the greatest ALS doctors in the world have come together as a team to try to create a treatment in four years or less to leverage their skills and talents to utilize the most important asset in the world, their time. Simultaneously while this was going on, I knew that we had to create a team in order to, to raise funds. I knew that we had to bring the friends and families of people with this horrific disease together as one team. So I created, I created a nonprofit organization called the ALS Knights. And the idea of this was to get an army of dedicated people together to help fight this disease and raise money for ALS One. In the first 60 days, amazing things happened. We had over 700 people become a knight. And what was a night? You had to be willing to do five things. Be committed until it's a cure, do at least one fundraiser a year, display all ALS1 and ALS Night logos, call to action as needed, and be mindful of the other family members uh, or families in the community that had ALS. In those first 60 days that we, we started this, we had people from all over come help. We formed a marketing team, a fundraising team, a sponsorship team. People from all over the disease began to, began to contact us and say, I wanted to come in, I wanted to help. They heard what we were trying to do. We had, in a short period of time, in those 60, 90 days, we were in 22 fundraisers, raised over $250,000, were expected to raise a half a million dollars by July 1, and we have people joining the organization every single day and we've created 32 fundraisers already in the pipeline for next year. Absolutely amazing. And it shows you what can happen when people come together as a team and decide to utilize their skills, leverage their talents, and most importantly, leverage the time. Imagine if 6,000 U.S. citizens were captured and, and imprisoned every year what would we do as a society to save them? ALS captures and imprisons 6,000 people every year, except they're imprisoned in their own bodies. Should we as a society accept this? Is this okay? It has been 76 years since Lou Gehrig has died, and 465,000 people have died this horrific death. We had the ice bucket challenge, and it helped with awareness, and some much needed money for research, but now what? We need the research doctors, the family, the friends, anybody that has been connected to this disease to come together as a team, ALS1. I know all of this that I have done is not going to help me. But I hope 
that it helps the next husband, father, or family that might get this horrific disease, maybe, just maybe, not have the outcome that I will have. I ask for everybody that is connected to this or is passionate about this to step up and help. Now is the time to make the change. I say this speech today in honor of my three kids, Scott, Jake, and Joe, that they will realize if you stand alone, you get stuck. If you come together, you can go far. And that this is my last lesson to them. And that through this journey, they see strength, courage, and grace. Thank you.